Yep. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I guess I can continue on just with this account without having to log in separately. Same. It seems like. Uh, yes, I think that's true. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, we'll give everybody obviously some time to uh, take a little a short break before we start the session. Uh, I'll have to get in touch with David Buckley and, and get things set up. But nominally, we'll try to get started in about maybe ten minutes. Um, know that there's a special Slack channel for the live observing session. So if you want to join that, if you're planning on participating tonight, you can uh, suggest targets or ask questions or just hang out and chat, whichever you like. Um, so you can look for that in the list of Slack channels. It's, uh, I believe, uh, live observing. So hashtag live observing on Slack. Okay, and I'll see everybody in about 10 minutes. Okay, David, I see you're there. Yeah, I am. Hi, Dan. Great. Hello, everybody. So, um, are we ready to begin? Well, we so we just we just got done with the session a bit right now, so we're just a little bit behind. So, I told everybody who wants to join that we'd probably give it about uh, ten minutes before That's we good. start things off for real. Okay, I, I just started everything off here. And I've just discovered um, when I went on to Sky that the telescope is not tracking for some reason. So I've had to get a technician at Sutherland to, uh, to, to go up and have a look what's going on. So hopefully they'll sort that out soon. Okay. Um, so I'll just, um, uh, I guess I'll just uh, wait a bit um, and see what happens. Um, do you want to tell me when we start then in about... Um, a quarter past or something yeah, like that's that? What, that's what I was thinking. Okay, great. I'll just mute things and uh, I'll come back in about 10 minutes then. Okay.
but I'm back. I'm still there. See you. Uh, your 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 audio was really poor quality there, so we didn't quite get what you said. Oh dear. Okay. Um, now, now it's a lot better. So whatever you just did is is way better. I did nothing. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe just a temporary internet glitch. Hopefully that was the case. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, are we ready to begin? Do you think, Dan? Um. Yeah. Well, I, I let's see. I said uh, a quarter after, so we can give it another two minutes. Okay. I'm going to be swapping to my other webcam uh, because then you can look at the various GUIs. Um, I have sometimes issues with it um, flipped and so um, it's sort of back to front, but hopefully it will, it'll be okay. You can just tell me if it's not, um, uh, not working properly. So I think that's reflected. So I'm just going to try. Yes, it is. Although it's, it's also a bit blurry, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let's see if I can flip this. Okay, it's flipped it for me. Did it flip it for you? Uh, there is no flip for us. I wonder if I have to restart it. Um, I'm just going to go back to my um, integrated camera, see if it flips. Did that flip it? Uh, well, we're still seeing you right now. Yeah, but it did, when I I keep clicking this, it, does that do anything? I'm clicking a button that says mirror my video. Uh, you look the same. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, it sort of didn't flip properly before. And then when I reconnected, it did. Um, so let me just uh, stop and start again and, and see if that fixes it, okay? Sure. You could also try restarting Zoom if that's not what you Yeah, mean. that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah okay. I will. Okay, I'm back. Let's see if it's uh, helped. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks the same as before. Damn it. You don't know if there's any other I mean, I'm just going into the, the Zoom um, video. Um, you know, there's a, a button that says stop video and then video settings. And it, there's a my video where you can mirror my video. And there's a little window that pops up. Every time I click it, it mirrors it. But it doesn't have any effect on the main uh, window for some reason. I think I'll just proceed uh, with yeah, not a big deal. because 
I can't for the life of me work out how to get this um, to work. Anyway, um, I guess I can start. Yeah, sure. I think we're past time now, so we can start okay. when ready. So let me welcome everybody to this uh, virtual observing session from uh, the South African Astronomical Observatory, um, which is um, uh, based in Sutherland. Um, so we have uh, a whole array of telescopes um, about 375 kilometers away from where I'm sitting right now, which is a, uh, a remote observing workstation at the headquarters of the observatory here in Cape Town. Uh, and because of uh, COVID situation, um, we're actually remotely operating all of our telescopes up at Sutherland at the moment. Um, and of course, we also have robotic telescopes, which um, just do their own thing without any human intervention at all. Um, so our, our main telescope at, at Sutherland is, um, is SALT, a 10 meter class optical telescope. Um, and uh, every night, um, it's being operated by an astronomer and operator, and they're, they're both based here in Cape Town, running it from Cape Town. So there's no presence of anyone up in the domes um, at night at the moment. We do have technical support staff that live up there, and so if we need to, we can, um, uh, we can have people go up and, uh, and check things during the daytime or if there's something that happens at night. So this is just sort of a, I guess, um, introduction to what it's all about observing. And um, in many respects, it's no different being here in Cape Town, operating the telescopes remotely to being up there um, in Sutherland where the telescopes are physically present. We're using uh, uh, VPN systems uh, to connect in to the telescope control systems and the instrument control systems. And these um, work just the same wherever you are. And in fact, uh, uh, at some point, we, we are hoping that we'll be able to start operating the telescopes uh, from our homes rather than like in here where I'm in a, in a special remote observing room. The only reason we're not at the moment is is basically for safety issues because uh, we have have to make sure that if there's any internet um, down uh, issues that it doesn't leave the telescope in a, uh, a vulnerable state. So I'm just going to take you through a few of the things that we do when we set up observing and hopefully get on to um, some objects to observe. I'm going to switch um, back to the other webcam and first of all show you uh, what it's like up there uh, at the telescope because what we have is a, a webcam in the telescope and uh, I'm, I'm just going to turn on now um, some lights um, so that you can see the telescope from uh, from this camera so uh, hopefully you can see uh, a picture there of the inside of the dome um, and I'm just going to uh, move the web camera around so that you can see um, So I'm sort of pointing it around. There's the top of the telescope um, So this web camera I can move it uh, all the way around to uh, To check out what's on the observing floor um, and uh, It's a rather unusual design telescope if you if you can see there, I don't know if that's clear enough. Well, it's back to front, of course. Um, this is an old English telescope. When I say English, I mean the mount design is called an English mount. And it's a rather peculiar sort of design, which uh, is, is basically um, a two-peer system uh, and an equatorial mounted telescope. So it's a bit different to most modern telescopes, which are uh, altitude azimuth telescopes. Um, but this telescope dates back to the 1960s um, and it's basically been turned into a remotely controlled telescope. Um, it's been upgraded with uh, encoders um, and so 
it's it's actually um, quite a capable telescope. What it has as an instrument, you can see on the bottom here, is what's called an EMCCD camera. Um, EM stands for electron multiplication, and you probably come across CCD cameras. So this is a special type of camera that allows you to do uh, low uh, photon um, rate objects at high time speed, minimizing the noise. And so it can be, it can be used for doing um, uh, time resolved observations down to sub second uh, exposure times. So I'm going to um, uh, set up the telescope onto a target now. Of course, I need to turn off uh, the lights, which I'll, I'll do. And uh, the dome is, is open. And in fact, I've already set up the instrument, um, but it's not pointing at any particular field at the moment. Um, so over here on this other GUI is where I actually control uh, the telescope. So there are uh, various uh, buttons that I can use to turn the lights on and off um, and to set up the tracking of the telescope to point it where I want it to point and so on. So the object that I'm going to set it up on shortly is shown in this, uh, this image here, which is uh, from the, the sort of, um, uh, I guess it's from the digital sky survey, which we use to uh, select targets. Um, so we can put the coordinates of the target into, into a, um, uh, a little menu box. It will come up with the field of view. Uh, and that green circle is basically the field of view of the instrument that we will see. And then it's up to the observer to then check that the alignment between what we're expecting, namely in that green circle, and what we see on the instrument are the same. And then we know that we're pointing at the right object and we can begin the observations. By the way, if you've got any questions while I'm um, talking, please, uh, please ask. Um, I'd rather get questions as we go rather than a whole lot at the end, if, if you have any. So if you have any now, uh, it would be a good time just to pause and, uh, uh, and you can ask them. Dan, will you keep an eye out on chats if there's any sort of things that come in? Yep, yeah, sure. Um, and so you can post, post any questions in Slack and you can also use the hand up, of course, and we'll give you a chance to speak. So I'm going to take you across now to uh, the GUI that shows the output from uh, the CCD camera. Um, so that's over here. And uh, so this is a, a live image um, of, of the field in, in the um, CCD camera. So you can see stars there um, and you might see that there's some, apart from the fact that I'm holding this by hand, there's also sort of motion of the stars um, simply due to the seeing, the atmospheric uh, turbulence uh, creates image motion and it also creates uh, blurring of the uh, of the image um, due to the uh, the motion of the earth's atmosphere um, no doubt you will hear or have heard about adaptive optics i'm not sure if that's is that been a topic dan i've forgotten uh no it's not a topic um okay. but it, i believe we mentioned it briefly yeah, so adaptive optics is a means of removing uh, the effects of, of atmospheric turbulence. Um, it's usually most efficacious on larger telescopes and into the infrared. So actually at our observatory in Sutherland, we have no uh, AO type instrumentation. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, select a uh, a target and move the telescope to that target. Uh, and uh, as you're watching the field there, you'll, you'll notice that the, um, the stars will start moving. Uh, I'm basically reading this camera out at um, half a second exposure. 
continuously, but I'm not saving the data. We're just using it in what we call an acquisition mode. So over here on the, on the main GUI, um, I've already loaded in a, um, an object coordinate uh, and I then just um, tell the telescope to automatically point to the target and uh, it, it checks also that the telescope can safely move to the target without colliding with anything. Because of the strange design of the telescope, this English mount, there's lots of possibilities for it to crash into walls and railings and so on. So over here we have this funny looking GUI with the red um, surrounds, which is uh, basically a crash um, alert um, sort of GUI. So the only place we can point is inside this white region. Where we're pointing at the moment is this blue dot here. And where we're going to point is this light blue dot, as soon as I've told it to, to move to that um, object. <coughs> so I'm going to now tell it to automatically move the dome and the telescope to the, to the new object. And if you look at the output from the uh, from the CCD camera, I think you will see these sort of blurry images of stars going by as it starts to, uh, to move. Of course, the dome will get in the way as well, so uh, we won't see images there, um, uh, you know, static images until the telescope and the dome have both arrived at their predetermined positions. By the way, the other thing that we have to be very careful about when we're remotely observing is to check what the weather situation is continuously because, of course, if, if the weather suddenly deteriorated uh, and we weren't aware of it, uh, that risks, um, you know, risks the telescopes. So we have this um, weather system and uh, here you can see uh, what it's like up at the site at the moment. So those are all sky web cameras, live web cameras that are updated uh, about every couple of minutes. And uh, for the one on the left here with this funny annular circle here, this indicates the, the window of opportunity where the SALT telescope can point. SALT is a rather unusually designed telescope which limits where it can point in the sky. So it can only actually uh, observe objects inside this annulus, but it can then observe them for some length of time, maybe for an hour or a couple of hours in the south. So at the moment, um, if I just sort of hold it close in, and sorry that I can't solve this um, issue of the, uh, of the flipping, but there's a little round circle here to indicate where SALT is pointing at the moment. But of course, I'm not using SALT, I'm using the one meter telescope. This is another um, web camera from the Las Cumbres uh, Observatory's web camera. So Las Cumbres is a network of um, telescopes around the world, and three of the telescopes are here in South Africa. And then up at the top here, we have uh, basically graphical displays of the of the, of the weather. So we can look, for example, at the uh, relative humidity here. Uh, we can look at the, the temperature. At the moment, it's uh, um, a chilly 2.9 degrees up at Sutherland. Of course, we're in the middle of winter here, and we've just had a cold front come through in the last few days. Uh, the other things that we can see are the wind speed and direction, and also what the, the current seeing is, which is not great, it's uh, two and a half arc seconds seeing, which is pretty poor actually. So in the meantime, I've come back to uh, the CCD GUI and uh, we now have uh, a picture of the field of view. I'm just going to uh, set it up 
to, um, to make sure that I'm pointing correctly at the, the object that we're going to be observing. By the way, were there any um, objects which anyone suggested, Dan, to, um, to observe? So I haven't, I haven't seen any been posted in the Slack yet. So unless somebody sent something in to Chris or by some other means, I'm not aware of any. But this would be a good time for people to send them in, even if they're just kind of, you know, famous Messier objects or whatever you like to look at. Yeah, exactly. So what, what I'm going to be observing now is a, an object called a magnetic cataclysmic variable. Uh, these are binary systems with a, uh, a strongly magnetic white dwarf uh, in orbit with a fairly low mass uh, M or K type um, star. And uh, because there's mass transfer going on, and also because of the strong magnetism of the white dwarf, uh, the material is threaded onto the magnetic field lines and is channeled down onto the magnetic poles of these um, magnetic white dwarfs. And in so doing, the plasma is heated up to very high temperatures, like 10 to the 8K, uh, and so emit uh, quite a lot of the um, energy that's released in the form of X-rays, which is often how these objects are, are first detected. Um, so this is a particularly interesting one because it's of its geometry, it just happens to be uh, have its orbital plane uh, at almost um, 90 degrees to, well, it's almost aligned with our line of sight so that uh, every orbit uh, it eclipses. And tonight, uh, the system is predicted to be eclipsing at about, um, let's see, about eight o'clock um, local time. Um, so that's almost half an hour from now. So hopefully when we get onto it and I start taking observations, we will see the star and then we will see as it begins to dim and go into eclipse. That's the whole idea. Um, so I'm just going to um, quickly check the alignment of this. So I'm just going to be a little bit silent while I, uh, while I do this. Um, and once I'm sure we're set up, then we can have a look more closely uh, at the um, at the field of view. Any questions in the meantime? So I haven't seen any questions yet, but there, there are a lot of uh, target suggestions now that people have been posting mainly in the chat and the Zoom chat. Okay, well, well, so. well, we'll get on to this target first, and then uh, towards the end of the session, I'm happy to go and just point at a few random targets, if they're visible. Yeah. I, hope, I hope people... Yes, can. right. So that's something that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think your, your, your assignment, if you suggested a target, is now to check if that target is above the horizon in exactly. South Africa. Yeah. In Sutherland uh, in particular. There, there were a couple of technical questions. So one is basically the, the limiting magnitude for the telescope, uh, and another is the field of view. Yeah, the field of view is about six arc seconds square. Um, and so six by six arc, arc seconds, I should say, not square. Um, minutes or seconds? Sorry, what did I say? Seconds, <laughs> minutes. <laughs> that would be a very small field of view. Yeah, uh, yeah, six arc minutes um, on a side, uh, and then uh, limiting magnitude. Of course, that's very dependent on the on the seeing, um, but uh, typically we can get down to twenty first magnitude with sort of uh, minutes um, integration time less if we're doing. Um, uh, much shorter integrations. So, for example, for this particular object, uh, because it's um, uh, because we want to measure the brightness as it goes into eclipse, we want to take short exposures, probably 10 second exposures. Uh, and then in so doing, then um, uh, we will be able to resolve as the object uh, begins to dim and go into 
uh, into Eclipse. Okay, I'm just uh, just sorting out where I'm pointing. Um, so just give me a minute or two while I while I do that. Yeah, that's there. So being an observational astronomer often challenges your um, your ability for pattern recognition because you have to check um, star charts like like this one here um, with what I see on the camera here and um, of course a, no telescope perfectly points to where it's told to go um, but for the cases where you're doing imaging observations uh, it's not as critical uh, that you have to have, um, you know, you have to um, have the telescope point exactly where you, you want it. So I've found it. I'm just going to nudge the telescope a bit um, to make sure that the object is um, properly um, centered in the center of the field. So here you might notice that it's, um, it's moving slowly down because I've just given it a command to move the telescope. Uh, and the object is, is basically uh, about here. But once I get on, you'll see it in more detail. So this camera has a set of different filters and um, in this particular uh, case where we're wanting to make a timing of the eclipse, we want as many photons as possible. So I'm running with no filter. That means that we maximize the number of photons from the source. It also means that we also uh, have uh, a lot of photons from the sky as well. So it's often a trade-off depending on how bright the object is. And because it's relatively faint, um, I'm sticking with, with a filterless observation uh, for this particular object. So I'm just gonna set up now a couple of things I need to uh, enter in, in terms of um, uh, making sure that the header information, which will go into the FITS header, of the data has all of the requisite information, uh, namely the coordinates of the object and the name of the object, etc. So I'm um, just have to enter that for a moment. Just give me a few moments. Although we have streamlined the operation of these telescopes um, quite a lot, there's still quite a few manual things you have to do um, in the case of uh, uh, these remote observations on these older telescopes. So uh, we don't have automatic operation of the head with the telescope. In this case, in general, that's not the case. So, for example, for for salt, um, it's a a one button click to go and point an object, uh, point the telescope at an object, and uh, and that's really important for that telescope because you only have a limited time to observe something because of that annular region that you are restricted to observing, it means that you have to queue schedule all of the observations and therefore you have to be uh, as efficient as possible.
Um, so I've set up the, the information uh, on the uh, header, uh, coordinate information. I'm now setting it up to do repeat exposures. So um, I'm using it in a mode where it will do uh, something like a thousand repeat uh, observations. Actually, I'll make it less than that. I'll make it uh, 500 repeat observations of um, five seconds. And so that's 2,500 seconds worth of continuous observations. Um, I'm also changing the binning factor uh, to four by four pixels because we're oversampled with this um, camera. In other words, the pixel scale is much smaller than, than an arc second, uh, and therefore you oversample if you, if you don't bin. Okay, and now I set up for um, what's called GPS triggering. Um, so we have um, basically uh, a GPS timing system and we, that's necessary because we want to time tag uh, our exposures to be accurate to microseconds. And so you need a, uh, a really good time system uh, to be able to achieve that. So I set up a, a start time by entering uh, a time in the future, about 30 seconds from now. Um, and, and then, uh, let's see, sorry, I'm just thinking to myself here. And then I set up the exposure time, which I said was five seconds. And uh, I need to update the time because I was too slow. Okay, so the observations have been initiated. So it's just counting down now to the first uh, opening of the shutter. Um, I'm just being I just need to focus things for a moment. Okay, so the first frame has just come up. I'll just show it to you. Um, That's the feel of this project. Uh, to be, I think, secure. It seems to be now. Uh, much further to south. So I explore it. So that's our project. Um, so let's take a raw CD train from this EMT camera. So, if you look at it, you might know how to do it. Um, not that noticeable. Pardon? Oh, I was going to say, we were having some trouble with the audio again, but it looks like it just came back. 
Yeah, I, I'm on uh, Ethernet here, but uh, I don't know. It's sometimes just, yeah, sorry right. about that. I don't think there's much I can do about it. Yeah. But it's, it's okay again now, but you might have to repeat what you said in the past uh, 40 seconds or so. Okay, I was just saying that um, I've set it up now to do five second repeat exposures. So this is a picture of the full field of the CCD camera, this EM CCD camera. And uh, I'll point out in a moment where the object is. Um, and in fact, it is this one here. I put across. It's to the to the right of the cross, right upper part of the cross. So it's uh, this object here. So these type of observations are fairly boring in some respects because it's a repeat second exposure. Uh, and I would typically observe this, well, depending what sort of science I'm trying to do. Uh, I would try to observe this for maybe um, uh, several hours to cover the eclipse and either side of the eclipse. Let's see. So I, I think there's a, a question from Fiona uh, about your research. Sure. Yeah, I was just wondering what it was that you normally observe for your own research. Um, so I definitely recognize your name um, from the world of Novi. So is that like your main focus or um, CVs? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I'm sort of interested in, uh, in compact objects and, and accretion processes, although in recent years, I've also become more involved in transient follow ups. So mm. Novi fall into that latter class. Um, and I run a program with SALT, which is a, a transient follow-up program. And we're quite sort of um, wide in our, in our scope. So uh, although I have a particular interest in these so-called cataclysmic variables, I, I also um, work on X-ray binaries as well. Um, and so... Uh, I work on a variety of things, including Novi, X-ray binaries, um, gamma ray bursts. I mean, anything that, that is sort of transient in nature um, is something that, that I have an interest in. Um, uh, but yeah, Novi is something which I guess is something uh, that, that's a recent interest, um, which was actually through a uh, a previous student here who's now postdoc in the US. Cool. Um, I also noticed um, you mentioned SALT, and SALT was involved in the initial um, spectral classification of Nova Ret, I think. Um, I was wondering yes. if, if that Nova is currently observable. Um, Regrettably not. It's, <laughs> uh, it's left the window of observability uh, for salt for the season now. So uh, it's in the twilight and therefore we cannot observe it. But it's interesting you should mention uh, that object actually because uh, this was, uh, a, well, as you, as you probably know, it's a, a very bright nova um, mm. in reticulum. And uh, uh, one of the people who works on novi within the salt uh, transient program uh, initiated the observation and then about two weeks ago and well, maybe longer than that I got an alert from some colleagues I work with on x-ray transients from e oh. and e is is a new hard x-ray satellite uh, which is doing a very sensitive survey of the of the sky and uh, they were looking for so-called changing look AGN, active galactic nuclei, and they'd flagged a particular object to be one of these. And then uh, they actually, what they actually observed was this nova. And so um, 
I had to disavow them of, of the fact that this was not a, an AGN. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was sort of interesting. Sometimes serendipity like that happens quite a lot, actually. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I'm just going to uh, go back to show you the, uh, where we're at with these observations, because I think it's, it should be going into eclipse um, fairly soon. It would be quite nice to, to actually see it happen in real time. Um, so I'm just going to go and check. Um, yeah, in fact, I think it's just disappeared. It's just gone into eclipse. So the object was here, which I pointed out to you before, and now there's nothing. Well, we, we can't quite see your cross here. You may need to tilt the camera. There. Okay, yeah, the camera's uh, just go. gone loose on me as well. Um, yeah, let me just uh, get that back. So basically, the object was there where the cross is. I'll just move it away. Maybe there's something very faint just there. But it was a lot brighter before when I was pointing it out to you. Um, oops, sorry about this. I, I should have uh, got a better tripod for this little web camera. Yeah, so that's quite nice. We've caught the eclipse. Um, wh why are we interested in these things? I'll, I'll quickly show you while this uh, observation continues and I'll keep an eye out. Um, I'll just leave the cross sort of close to where I expect it to pop back because it will come out of eclipse before we finish. Um, and what I'll do now is I'll just show you a quick um, schematic of the sort of thing that we, we're observing, this, um, this so-called magnetic cataclysmic variable. Um, because they're quite neat objects and um, uh, let me just see if I can find something. I should have had this loaded before, but... Um, I'm just going to um, share my screen uh, so you can see this other image, uh, this um, presentation, I should say. Um, so let me... Can you see this um, PowerPoint slide? Yep, looks good. Great. So this is what we're observing. This is a schematic, obviously, of, uh, of one of these systems. So the little white dwarf is the little white thing at the bottom. And those wispy white tendrils are sort of uh, schematically showing the uh, the plasma, which is uh, being threaded onto the magnetic field lines and then is channeled down onto the surface of the white dwarf. Remember, these stars are about the size of the, 
of the earth. And so these accretion hotspots where all this energy ends up is something like the size of Greenland. Um, and uh, so these systems show um, really interesting eclipses. I'm just going to um, uh, go through. So most of the energy comes from this shock region um, just above the surface of the, of the white dwarf. Um, and I'm just going to skip over these. And this is a sort of animation of what's going on in not the system we're observing tonight, but another one. So you can see the limb of the red uh, donor star, uh, the M star, as it um, rotates, it blocks out the white dwarf. And that causes the dip in the light curve that is also shown in that figure. I mean, the interesting thing about this particular system is that the eclipse is, is actually quite complicated because it covers the two hot spots on the white dwarf. If you look closely, you can see that uh, on the, the blue white dwarf, there are two little white spots at the base of the magnetic fields. And they're responsible for like 90% um, of the luminosity of the whole system, those two little dots. And so when it eclipses, uh, you see an initial um, dip um, as, it, as the first spot eclipses. And then, it, then there's a little plateau, and then the second spot dips, and then it goes down to the bottom of the eclipse, where there's still some light, but not, not a huge amount. This is magnitude scale. And then it pops out again on the other side. So in the case of this, this is what this particular system uh, did uh, in the eclipses. And you can see that uh, this was highly... Um, high-speed photometry, each data point there is a tenth of a second. And uh, so through this observation, we are able to constrain the size of the spots and where they are in magnetic longitude and latitude on the, um, on the surface of the uh, white dwarf. So yeah, these are sort of interesting systems. And this one, okay, it's just come out of eclipse. I don't know if you can see, but um, here on the, um, near the cross wire here. We're, we're still seeing your PowerPoint. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me uh, release that. Right, so can you now see the cross and the fact that where there was blank before, just to the right upper part of the cross, is now that little faint star that we saw at the beginning of the observation. What would be neat is to actually plot this in real time and have a real time data reduction script running on the, the CCD uh, data frames as they, come in, as, as they come in. And in fact, on an older instrument, we used to indeed be able to do that, but uh, we seem to have taken a, uh, a step back in that uh, this new camera, uh, as of yet, we, we don't have a, a sort of real-time light curve generator for it. Right, so um, where are we at? We're at uh, eight o'clock and we've got an hour to go. That's right, Dan? Yes, that's the plan. So um, we could sit here for an hour just staring at frames coming in every five seconds, which I'm sure uh, we'll send everyone to sleep um, if you're not already asleep. So if there are any um, suggestions for, for things to go and look at, I'm, um, I'm open to them. Let's see. So a couple people were keen to observe Centaurus A. Okay, let me... Um, so what I do here is uh, I use Aladdin and I just put in the name of the object. Oops, that didn't work. Unless you have to make the call.
No, I think, unfortunately, that is too far gone. It's 13 hours minus 43. Just let me double check. Yeah, so it's, it's right on the threshold, I think. Uh, so it depends on your pointing limits. Yeah, and because of this, um, well, I'll, I'll check it. Just let me uh, put in the coordinates. Oh, actually, it is visible. So here's the crash limit GUI. Um, can you see that? It's in the corner of the camera. So you might have to hang on. I'm doing two things at once here. I need to. So it's that little light green spot here. Yep, we can see it. We'll go there. So I've loaded the coordinates in and I just press uh, what's called, well, I better actually stop this uh, CD operation. I've stopped and And it will start moving away um, to the object. So you see the disaster going the field it's just going to start there. It's just going on to get rid of the same name. So um, I take uh, some images with the first So your audio is. Uh a little bit glitchy again, but we could definitely see the dust lane there for a second. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's all here. So I was just saying, uh, what filters would you like? I just said my speaker's not working. Um, I don't chat. Yeah, so, so David is asking if people have a pr preference for which filter to observe the galaxy in because there's uh, these different optical filter passbands that you can choose. I could try an H alpha filter if you like. Yeah, so there was actually just a suggestion to do that. So that would be a good choice. So I'll just show you what's involved in doing that uh, on the GUI here. I, I go over to to this tab, and uh, I am hoping it's actually loaded. Okay, so that filter wheel doesn't have one. So we have two filter wheels. One has the the so-called Johnson Cousins filter set of broadband filters. The other has the Sloan filter set and an H alpha wide filter. So I'm going to choose that one
and uh, then I'll come. Now, what I didn't do or tell you about is that we also have um, a guidance system on this telescope. So what we can do is set up a little guide camera that's outside of the field of view of the main object, and we can use that to, uh, to guide. If we don't, then on you know, exposure time of a few minutes, So one other filter suggestion that was made was actually just to get several, because then the students might be able to process the data tomorrow to try to make a color image. Okay, we can do that. that that's a, a good idea. I'll do a sequence of different uh, filters. Um, so let me start. I'm just going to set up to get the guide star going first. So while David's setting up, feel free to think about more targets to observe. And um, you can also think about northern targets if you're planning on joining for the second observing session at the Liverpool Telescope in a couple hours. Uh, Dan, something fun that we did a couple of years ago in India um, was uh, that uh, they followed up a GRB and then uh, we wrote a common GCN circular with all the participants of the school. I don't know if it's too ambitious to do something like that for this year. I don't know, just throwing in the idea in case you were not planning on anything like that. Yeah, so of course the problem with GRBs is they're a bit random. There was a GRB a few hours ago. It's too far north for this telescope, and I think it's also basically in the galactic plane. So it's got loads of galactic extinction in front of it, so there's not much of a chance of finding an afterglow. Um, but of course there's other slower transients that are up all the debt for much longer periods that we could certainly observe and potentially issue some report on if people are keen to do that. So I posted a few links in the Slack channel for places you can go to find um, reports on new or otherwise, our targets that are otherwise doing interesting new things. So um, students can feel free to browse those and, and look for uh, targets that might be interesting to get data on. There are these really nearby supernovae, Dan. So I think reporting eight, uh, via ATEL or the IAU astronaut photometry of some nearby supernovae could be fun for the students. So there are at least two or three very, very nearby supernovae now. So if you guys want to look up those nearby supernovae and 
requires data on that, then you could be on the ATEL and IU astronaut wall of fame. <laughs> Yeah, so if you need help finding those, we can, of course, uh, point them out to you. But they're, they all have telegrams and astronauts and are reported to TNS. So any of the three links that I posted should, should point you to them if you do a little bit of uh, homework there. They are all pretty low, though. So it depends on the pointing limits of the telescope. It will actually be able to get to them. I, I think they've all set from South Africa. But we, that's something that we'll, you can check. So David, what are we are we integrating in H alpha right now? No, I'm just trying to locate a suitable guide star. Still, sorry about that. Ah, so okay. we're not integrating at all at the moment. Um, that's just a previous image that was um, up on the screen. Um, okay, no worries. If I can see anything now. Yeah, so if, for those of you who haven't observed before, which I imagine is most of you, uh, of course, because the Earth rotates, that means stars move across the sky. And if you have a telescope that's zoomed in onto a small field of view, they move quite quickly through the sky, approximately one arc second per second. Uh, so they will rapidly streak across the image if you don't have a tracking system. And most telescopes have a tracking system that knows Earth's rotation and moves the telescope accordingly. But even that is usually imperfect because unless your tracking is extremely good, you will slowly drift away from where the target uh, is centered and that will still smear things out if, over time scales of more than about 30 seconds to a couple minutes. So usually what a telescope will have is a guiding system where it finds a bright star that's very close to the thing you're observing, uh, has a fast readout camera, and just basically constantly nudges the telescope to keep that guide star exactly the same uh, pixel in the image. Um, and so then that way you get a nice unblurred image other than of course the effects of the atmosphere. But that does mean you have to actually find a, a suitable star to do this with, which isn't always easy, especially if you have a big galaxy filling the field like uh, we have here. So I've just found a guide star. And so this is a little, another little camera and uh, there's a little box there centered on what the guide, st the guide star that I chose. Um, and it gives, uh, it also gives information on the, on the seeing and the brightness of the guide star. So I'm going to set up now to do some exposures with the H alpha filter. Um, how long an exposure would you like? <laughs> Well, don't know how long someone it. can put their hand up to suggest. <laughs> Fiona, it sounds like you have a suggestion. No, I was just saying I don't know how long is reasonable for actually getting a, like, it's a pretty bright object, is it? Or? It's quite bright, yes. Yeah, well, it's, it's a galaxy, so the considerations for galaxies are very different from the kind of point sources that we normally think about in time domain astronomy. And the considerations for a narrow band filter are very different from a broadband filter because there's so much less light that is coming through that very narrow pass band. So usually when you're talking about narrow band imaging, you integrate for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, probably we don't want to you know, take up the whole rest of the session, but maybe a few minutes might be reasonable. Say four yeah, minutes. I'm just gonna start with uh, three repeat one minute exposures, which um, you can co-add of course later if you want to. Um, so yeah. I've just started that. Yeah. So, so you, you might remember my lecture on uh, where I said that read noise is usually negligible in the optical because the sky noise dominates everything. So in narrowband imaging, this is actually not the case. And it might be a case where you basically want to integrate as long as you can to minimize the number of readouts that you do. But here, because we still want to get those desert exposures to remove cosmic rays, it's still probably better to get uh, three shorter exposures.
So there's a question, it was just sent to me, but I think actually David uh, can answer this better since it's about this telescope uh, from, from username Kushika, Kushka. Uh, maybe you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, hi. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, is there any uh, like optimum separation that we have to like you know, consider when we consider a guide star? Like the optimum like separation of the guide star and the target? Um, not really. I mean, obviously, you're restricted uh, to a region which is outside of the field of view of the main instrument. Um, and then still within the field of view of the auto guiding system. So it, it's typically um, of the order of like 10 arc minute um, separation, perhaps between actually no less than that, uh, between the guide star and the uh, and the object of interest. So here's the first image, by the way, that's just come in the, the 60 second image and uh, I can play around with with scaling, I mean, this is a, a lookup table, which is just a linear scale here. Uh, this is a, a log scale. Uh, I think there's also, a, I know they don't have the, um, yeah, I thought they might have had the other, uh, like um, DS9 type scaling, but they don't. So, of course, they're fairly boring when they're just single filter images. It's only later when you combine them that you'll get the nice colors coming out. So it's counting down to the last of the three repeat H alphas. Oh, and something just went through the field of view. It must have been a satellite. So for those of you who start looking at this data, uh, the third and last H alpha image has a trail going through it, which I'm presuming is a satellite or possibly a meteor, I don't know. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna go and change uh, the filter now. Um, if I had my wits about me, I would have set up an observing um, uh, procedure um, to do the automatic filters, but uh, that's gonna take, too long, so I'm just going to do this manually by doing uh, three repeats of, of different filters. So I'm going to move on to the G filter now, which is a broadband, uh, roughly sort of equivalent to the visual V filter in the Johnson system, um, and uh, and we'll take uh, uh, some uh, three repeats of of those. I wonder if I should maybe change it to 30 seconds for those. What do you think, Dan? I, I think 30 seconds is fine for, the, for those, yes. Yeah. Uh, unless the readout's super slow anyway. It's not that slow, actually. Yeah, okay, let's do three by 30 seconds in the broadband yeah. filters. Yeah, I've done that. So we're using this um, camera in what we call uh, conventional mode. Um, which is how it's mostly used, but you can use it in the so-called electron multiplication mode. And this is a technique where on the serial readout register, um, if you know about CCDs, then you know that there are parallel readouts of rows that when you're clocking out the, uh, the charge that's accumulated during an exposure, it moves down into what's called the serial readout register and then uh, it's in that re serial readout register that you can actually apply a voltage across uh, the respective pixels to amplify the charge. And so you end up um, with a, um, I guess, a, a much larger number of electrons where you sort of beat down in certain regimes the signal to noise ratio. Um, and so this is quite useful in low light level um, where you might be more often dominated by the readout noise of the CCD. This is sort of bringing it back closer to being what a, um, what a photon counting detector would give you, about root two actually of what a photon counting detector would give you. 
Okay, it's finished the, the three G-band images. So uh, there's the three G-band images. I haven't tweaked the focus very much on these. So I think there might be a problem here because if you remember, uh, I was going filterless for the, the CV observation. And now I put a filter in the beam and so the focus changes. So I'm just gonna do a quick uh, refocusing job because I think these, uh, these images of CNA will be uh, a lot blurrier than what they could have been. So it'll just take me a minute to do this. So in case anybody's wondering uh, and you didn't catch what David said before, so what you're seeing right now is not actually the telescope. That is an archival image from uh, an old sky survey that says, shows what the region where the telescope is pointing and what we expect to see. Uh, whereas the telescope itself was what you saw a moment ago, which was it had a smaller field of view and was a, a segment of the galaxy. Yeah, that's, that's where we're pointing at the moment. So I just made a focus adjustment and clearly it's in the wrong direction because now those stars are looking like awful donuts. So I have to go back and, uh, again, this is a, a manual process, unfortunately. So it's, um, it's not ideal. So for, for any of you who join for both sessions, you'll see the full kind of uh, range of how optical astronomy is conducted. So one is, is the very classical style where focus and exposures and everything are, are controlled by the, the observer. And the other, which will have be how Liverpool Telescope operates later tonight, is, is everything is completely robotic normally. And all this is done without any human intervention. We have another new one meter telescope here, which is still undergoing commissioning and that uh, because it's been designed to be essentially a robotic telescope as well, uh, will have auto focusing feature. And we're hoping to actually to, to possibly um, upgrade this telescope to have uh, auto focusing feature as well. On the Sutherland Plateau, we have something like 20 telescopes um, of varying apertures from what is called the extremely little telescope, the killer degree extremely little telescope, which is not much more than a, um, a camera with a, 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 um, a thousand degree field of view. Um, and it's used to do a very shallow but wide survey to pick up uh, transit from exoplanets. Uh, it's a, a small telescope that's run by uh, Villanova University, amongst others, in the US. So that's the smallest telescope, and I think the aperture for that is, um, is four centimeters, 40 millimeter aperture. Uh, and then right up to, uh, to SALT, which is, is obviously a, a 10 meter um, telescope. And lots in between, like these one meter class telescopes. And also uh, infrared, uh, we have one infrared telescope uh, and we're about to get a new infrared, much larger 1.8 meter wide field infrared telescope um, next year. Okay, I think I've made an improvement to the focus uh, as I've been talking. Um, and so we can do the repeat um, exposures for the G filter again. I've overshot it. It's a bit of a, 
iterative process when you do this focusing and um, yeah okay I'm happy with that so I'm going to uh, to do those repeats again So I'm just going to go back and have a look at the what the weather situation is doing. We, as I say to you before, you have to be very uh, vigilant about weather conditions. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen. It's easier um, than using the web camera in this instance. Um, so this is the uh, image of the um, of the weather situation and. We're, we're not seeing it yet. Oh, okay. So okay. Does it come through? Yep, it's there. So there's the all sky cameras. Um, and you can see, is my cursor showing up when I move it? Yes. So this little circle is where salt is pointing. Not far from the middle of the galaxy. So this is Sagittarius here. Is Antares in Scorpio. Um, and then I can also go back and look at the, not go back, but go and also look at the weather predictions. So this is uh, something called Venture Sky, which is a, uh, a weather sort of app, which can tell you wind flow and cloud cover. So um, the observatory, Sutherland is, is about, where this little hand symbol is. Um, so you can see it's completely clear. Uh, this is actually a computer rendering of the prediction of cloud cover rather than actual cloud cover. But you can go to a satellite image like this one and see what the actual cloud cover was at 5.30. That was the last satellite um, image. So it's just finished the uh, the 3G band filters, and I'll I'll now move um, back to uh, well I'll change the filters now to um, to the the R. and do the same deal again um, three repeat. Uh, R band exposures. It's rather annoying that um, the GUI for this uh, is not the best and when you do repeat exposures um, for some reason it never shows you the first one you do so you're sort of running blind for the first exposure um, and so it's counting down um, now to the first exposure which is just about to finish but it won't display it um, it'll only display from the second onwards keeping us in suspense so it's looking like um, it's going to be a good night uh, in Sutherland judging from the from those web camera images um, which is gratifying um, the weather of the last few days has been quite poor. We've had some cold fronts coming through because it's the middle of our winter here and not usually the best time of year. But when we do get um, uh, good winter nights here, they can be very, uh, they can be very nice. Okay, so it's finished the, uh, the first of the R-band exposures. That's um, the one that's just shown here. So what I'll do at the end of this observing session is I'll copy the raw data um, to uh, a cloud site where they can be downloaded. Unfortunately, I haven't done 
any flats um, during the twilight. I didn't have enough time to do that. Um, but if I observe for the rest of the night, which is my intention, then I'll try and get some twilight flats in the morning uh, and um, they can all be there tomorrow if anyone wants to work on them. Okay, oh, that's great. finished the, um, uh, the R band. I'll go to the, the I now. So I'm, um, from Maria. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So why, uh, like, can you use the flats um, that you took like another night, for example? Yeah, basically you can. I mean, the thing about flat fields is it does a lot of different uh, corrections. It, it can correct high frequency pixel to pixel sensitivity variability. Um, if they're of sufficient high signal to noise. Um, it can also correct for things like dust on the filters. So what you often see in, not so much in the, um, in the real science images, but in the, in the CCD images, sorry, the flat field images, you'll often see little sort of donut shaped um, darker regions because there's a, a piece of dust on the filter which is out of focus to the detector and of course dust comes and goes it builds up over time and it can so you know to correct for for dust uh, you really want to have the flat fields as close in time to the actual time of your observations as possible okay thank you so that's the I band uh, images. That's the second one. I think it'll be interesting to do a Z band as well because it's uh, illustrative of the um, fringing that you get when you're in the infrared. Uh, and due to the fact that these are thin CCDs, uh, you get this uh, interference pattern generated by um, sky emission lines. Um, in the infrared, the sky is, uh, is quite bright because of uh, emission lines predominantly from the OH molecule uh, or the OH minus radical. And um, that causes um, this effect where you get interference pattern in the thin film of the um, of the CCD or the thin coating or just the general thinness of the CCD uh, and it causes this fringing pattern which is sometimes quite difficult to to deal with particularly if you're looking at faint objects um, so we'll go now on to the the three repeat z-band filters I don't know whether it's worth doing you as well. Do you want you? Maybe it's sort of interesting to do just to show how little throughput you get in the U filter compared to the other filters. It's basically because the sources that we look at are not that bright in the ultraviolet anyway. Um, coupled with the fact that the CCD is intrinsically not as efficient at shorter wavelengths. And so that all conspires to, given a, uh, a fixed exposure time, that, that your U-band images are typically underexposed or lower signal to noise than the other images. When I was a graduate student in Australia, I did a program of looking for optical counterparts of X-ray sources using photographic techniques. So that gives you some idea of my age um, on a Schmidt telescope. And so we did exposures uh, in the U-band filter and the, um, and the B filter to look for U minus B colors 
And for a, a spectral type of, say, A naught, in, in other words, U minus B equals zero, to get um, exposure, uh, to get sort of uniform exposures of, you know, the same apparent brightness in the U and the B filter meant you had to expose for 90 minutes in U, an hour and a half in U, and 18 minutes in B, and you would have images of the same apparent brightness for a, um, a U minus B equals uh, zero object. Huh. I'm for some reason not seeing anything in the in the V in the Z filter, which I'm not quite understanding. Um, so it supposedly just finished them. Something gets stuck. No, I don't think so. I think it's um, you try a different lookup tables. I've sort of lost count here. Let me just check. So we've done G, we've done H alpha, G, R, I, and Z. So that was three, four, six, seven. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Um, let me try a longer exposure. Actually, the same, the same deal is with the Z filter, but it's also, um, well, at least in terms of CCD sensitivity, it's not as, um, not anywhere near as sensitive um, as the um, shorter wavelength filters. But I'm surprised we didn't see anything. <coughs> yeah, there should definitely be signal because the sky is so bright at those bands. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. So I wonder if there's like a blocking filter installed by accident or the filter we didn't get, get all the way. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm just going to do a, a longer one and we'll see what pops up. So I suppose where you are, Dan, the sun hasn't even set yet. Nope, it'll be at least an hour. <laughs> Although it is noticeably setting sooner in night tonight now. Yeah.
Okay, I'm seeing something now. So I don't know why, why it wasn't apparent before. So that's the, that's a Z band image. Actually, it doesn't look too bad, does it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, at the end of this, I'm going to go to the U filter. And then we've done everything we can. Well, not quite. We could have done it in the Johnson filters, but there's not much point since they overlap in wavelength and won't give us any more information. Would we have time to squeeze in one more target after that? What's, what's your it's entirely is? up to um, up to you guys. I mean, uh, you're supposed to be starting at um, with the Liverpool telescope at what time was it? Um, the top of the hour, right? I, I believe there's an hour gap unless I unless I miss the time zones because it, the sun is not set at Liverpool telescope either. That's correct. No, of course. That's <laughs> this year. Okay. Although uh, I thought maybe um, Chris wanted to show flat fields or something, but I'm quite happy to keep going. Um, so if there are other targets that you guys would like to observe, um, then uh, fire away. Yes, well, we're, I'm still trying to uh, see if someone's able to suggest a, like a time domain type of target since it might be nice to do that since then we could actually report some new observations in real time. Well, I tell you what, almost real time. I tell you what you could possibly look at, which is really quite, um, always quite exciting is a, an object called AR SCO. I don't know if you know that Dan, it's a, what we refer to as a white dwarf pulsar. So it's a, a white dwarf spinning with, um, a period of 120 seconds, two minute spin period, and it has an absolutely enormous modulation in its optical um, light. Um, uh, it's, it's also, as a matter of interest, it's, it's also highly polarized. It's a very strong magnetic field system. But that's quite nice if you want some sort of variability where you want to say do a um, a periodogram or something like that, you know, a power spectrum. Um, yeah, so that's that's possible. And, and a couple of people, I think in the chat, were saying they approved of that. Um, so if we don't have anybody who, who has a new target to suggest, we could, we could sort of make that our, our final one. Um, okay. And that's sort of mildly scientifically interesting too, because um, we're monitoring its uh, spin variability. I mean, in terms of, uh, it has a, a strong P dot term. Uh, in other words, this, the, the spin period is changing. Um, the reason for that is that it's losing energy through dipole radiation. And so as it loses energy, it slows down. And uh, so timing of these pulses are quite important to determine the P dot term. Um, and also we've discovered that the system has, um, it also shows uh, wavelength dependency in terms of the phasing of the spin pulses, um, which is a relatively new discovery. Um, so apart from just seeing obje uh, an object that's crazily variable, um, it also has some scientific um, validity as well to observe it. So we could go on to that after this, if you like. So we're doing three 100 U-band uh, images now of Sen A, and I'll set, up, um, I'll set up the system to start, I can move over to AR SCO at the end of, uh, at the end of this.
Well, that's the U-band image that you can see there. It's not very um, exciting. As I said, uh, because of the, the very um, low throughput in the ultraviolet, um, you're only really just seeing one of the brighter um, foreground stars. You don't see Sene at all in that image. So I don't think yeah, that's going to be much use. <laughs> Sorry? Remarkable you can't even see the nucleus. Yeah. Well, we, we weren't pointing right at the nucleus, I don't think, were we? we were I think bit... it was in the sort of the top of the field. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're probably done with, with this target. Yep, it's coming down to the uh, 30 seconds to the end of the, the group of three exposures. So I'll, um, I'll move targets at the end of this. Oh, I just realized I, I didn't put the correct object name or coordinates in when I started the CNA run. So it has the old name of the previous CV that we were observing. So one of the things that you will need to do when you, um, uh, when you do the analysis of the data is just edit the header to put in the correct um, target name and coordinates. It's no big deal. I mean, it won't affect the, uh, the reductions at all. It's just, it'll be highly confusing if you look at it sometime later and see that it's got a different name to what you're expecting. Okay, so that's just finished. So I'm going to uh, move off to the next target, this uh, white dwarf pulsar that I was talking about. Um, so we'll move there. So how long do you think we'll be on that target, David? Oh, you can be on it as long as you want. I mean, I think if, we, if we're on it for say, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, you'll see the variability in it, which might be interesting. Um, Okay, so we did have a, another couple suggestions about some recent transients to observe. Oh, um, okay. I don't know if there's time to do that afterwards or not. Well, we but, can try. Yeah, we can certainly try. What were the recent transients? I can't see where they're suggested, um, unless I missed it. <laughs> yeah, well, well, someone sent them just private to me, privately to me in the Zoom chat, but hopefully we can get them in the Slack chat soon. Thanks. So I'm pretty sure the mistake you mentioned, David, is a mistake I've made every single classical observing run I've ever done. <laughs> and I've done a lot of classical observing runs. <laughs> right. Well, I tell you, the very first time I have observed with a CCD instrument was at Mount Stromlo Observatory in Australia, where I was a student. And in those days, they had no information in headers whatsoever, just simply in picks and, you know. <laughs> the number of bits in a pixel. <laughs> and yeah, you had to write cool. down on a piece of paper the exposure times and the filter you used and, um, and also the, um, uh, the time of the observation. And when, when we asked, well, couldn't we at least record the time 
the joke was because um, Olin Egan had been the previous director or a previous director at Mount Stromlo. And so there was this joke about the so-called Stromlo School of Photometry, where you only observed an object once. That was sort of what Egan did. He observed many, many, many objects, but only ever once. And therefore, if you only observe an object once, what's the point of recording the time? Because you don't need it. I mean, I know it's a joke, but, but it was sort of what... Uh, you know, what happened. Okay, I'm going to uh, move on to this other object now. And this time I am going to set it up with the correct ex um, object name and coordinates. So what filter will this be in, if any? Um, I'm going to go with the R-band filter um, for this object. And I'm also going to go for uh, two by two uh, binning, I'm uh, sorry, four by four binning. Uh, previously I was using two by two binning, but uh, because I'm going fast, I want to uh, minimize the dead time between frames. Um, um, I probably missed it before. Um, I was wondering when, when um, David was observing the CV earlier, why it was an unfiltered observation, maybe that was explained when I, the audio wasn't good or? Yeah, I was, um, the reason was that it was quite a faint object and the purpose of the observation was really just the timing of the eclipse. And so having uh, as many photons as possible in that situation um, is important. So that's why I didn't uh, use a, a filter because being a geometrical effect, in other words, you know, this is something blocking out the light, which is not wavelength dependent, um, then to get as many photons as possible, that's why you would use no filter in that type of observation. Okay, thanks. Okay, you'll see here now um, images coming up of the object. Um, so I'm just going to uh, nudge it so it's in the center of the field.
So the target is this one here on the right of the sort of triangle. Which would be the left to us, us in mirror world. Uh, sorry, yeah, because of this stupid flip thing, yeah. Um, okay, so I've set that up. I'm going to uh, now acquire a guide star for my observation. So that's again a bit of an iterative procedure of just clicking on an image and then getting the telescope um, XY slides that the guide camera is mounted on to to move to the guide star. You might just notice if you do a sort of visual comparison between the object and it's uh, the other one up here, you might notice the variability even by eye. And what did he say was the exposure time you're using for this, these observations? I'm going to use five seconds, but the ones that you're seeing live at the moment are one second. Right. Okay. Uh, but they're not being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> is there actually that much of a change in the noise from one image to the next, or is it just a function of the video? Um, uh, yeah, I think what you're seeing here is it's self-scaling to the maximum pixel and so it's it, it looks noisier than it really is um, just on the on the display here. So we're at the hour, which, which is the end of the sort of the scheduled session. So if anybody was, uh, you know, feeling that they're getting tired or, you know, need dinner or want to take a break, of course, it's totally fine to drop out uh, any time. And uh, you could come back later um, for the LT session or not. It's up to you. Um, just want to make sure everybody's aware. But uh, we are going to keep going for a little while is the plan. Um, so you're definitely welcome to stick around as well. Um, David, there was one more suggestion in the um, in the channel about uh, observing a new time domain target, uh, which is probably yeah. a dwarf nova. So that might be fun to use our last uh, school-based target. It's in the south, so it's it's something that can be done here and not from LTE. What's its um, uh, What's its position? Uh, 19 hours minus 47 degrees. I can send you the, the details uh, by chat. Okay, that would be good. Yeah. So I'm just about to start this one. Um, I'm just checking the filters. Um, so yeah, I just need to get this going. Yes, repeat that, that, five. So I'm going to change it to two seconds. It's bright enough.
Okay, we're running with two second exposures on this target. So what you should notice is this one will be varying a lot more than the others in the frame because it has this uh, two minute periodicity. So you might notice that it, sometimes it's fainter and sometimes br brighter than its, uh, than its uh, other ones in the field. So as I say, it's quite a peculiar object, this. It's, um, it's thought to be a highly magnetic white dwarf, which is um, in a non-accreting binary system. So there's no mass transfer going on like in the other system that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and the interaction is purely through the magnetic fields of the two stars, which is causing uh, a torque on the white dwarf to slow it down. And the fascinating thing about it is that uh, over the spin period, uh, it shows uh, huge variations in the polarization of the objects. So it's very strongly linearly polarized, up to 40% of the photons are linearly polarized. And that polarization changes over the spin cycle of the white dwarf. And um, so in many respects, it, it, it behaves a bit like a pulsar, except of course it's not a neutron star. Um, and the other interesting thing is that the, the entire luminosity of the object is dominated by non-thermal synchrotron emission. This is a process where you have electrons, relativistic electrons, which are being accelerated in a magnetic field and um, produce uh, th uh, non-thermal emission, right from the radio through to the x-rays. So this thing is also a radio source. Um, it's also an x-ray source. Um, so it's, it's quite an odd uh, object um, and quite unique. It's also quite close by. It's only 120 parsecs or so away from us. Okay, um, Dan, you've sent me the um, details of the other object, have you? I'll just have a look. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Okay, I'll um, I'll stick those in the in the target selection. Yeah. So this target was suggested by uh, Sneha, if I pronouncing your name right. It's, uh, it's very well observable. It's, it's, it should be close to overhead. Um, and it's a, it's a new transient that recently got much brighter than its counterpart magnitude. Oh, so it's probably changed quite a bit since the last time it was observed. So it might be a, a nice object to report. Yeah. So is it a known dwarf novae or is it just being discovered, do you know? I, I don't, I'm not aware of any previous variability. Uh, I didn't look into it in much detail. So it's a new transient, which is a dwarf nova. Most likely, yes. I don't think it's been classified spectroscopically. Yeah, uh, and, it, and it still came up uh, reporting this uh, new discovery. That's why I just uh, sent it on Slack. If it was uh, okay to observe, then we could uh, we can observe. That was the idea. Yeah, of course. So I've just um, produced the finding chart, which is is here, and uh, there's nothing actually right in the center of the field where the object is expected to be, which of course makes sense because this is an old image uh, from the Digital Sky Survey and therefore um, pre-discovery. So the fact that it's not there is not surprising. But when we go to this object now, we should see um, this brighter object uh, where there wasn't one before, hopefully. So maybe we spend um, another five minutes on on this one, do you think, Dan? And then we can move off to your dwarf nova. Oh, this was this is the dwarf nova that I had in mind. Oh, no, sorry. No, I mean, sorry, I got yes. So um, yeah, sure, that sounds good to me. So five minutes, we'll go from the the variable target here to the dwarf yeah. nova.
How many students have been observing before? Do we know that? Put, put your hand up if you've uh, physically been observing at a telescope before if you're in this uh, session. Okay, so you guys know what it's all about. Yeah, so I saw one hand up and I saw one person post in the chat. So, but, so it sounds like not very many. Right. But a few. I've not properly observed, but I've kind of been at a summer school where they had us doing it. They did some observing while we were kind of there and <laughs> not really the same thing as doing it all yourself. Which observatory was that? It was, it was like a little observatory in Slovakia, um, like Lomtatranska Lomnich, I don't remember. <laughs> Not Stelnate Plezo Observatory. Is it? Yeah, there's a, they've got the proper big observatory there, which is like up in the Tatra. That's um, right. There, yeah. But it's like in a nearby town. So it's okay. just a little... Um, I think there's like a six, like a one meter telescope, or no, 60 centimeter telescope that they yes. have, like at the actual um, institute itself. Yeah, yeah for yeah. me, in the, uh, the same situation, more or less. I went to this summer school of ESO Neon uh, at the La Silla Observatory. So we were like one week working on this. Uh, data and it was pretty cool actually. Good. Yeah, we have a quite a big observatory at my university, so I did it. It's my freshman year, I did there an observatory project. We looked at uh, some things and we made pictures after night observing and we did the data analysis, etc. Right. Where was that? Uh, at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, I'm going to stop this now and go to the Dwarf Nova, Dan. Okay, sounds good to me. So if anybody's curious about the target, uh, it was posted to the Slack channel with the link to the discovery. Uh, Astronomer's Telegram. So for that observation that we just stopped, I got 282 two second repeat exposures in the R band. Lots of data to process. That's nothing. I've gone whole nights of one second. <laughs> how much how much disk space does a whole night at one second read out speed? Uh, it's a couple of gigabytes, I think. Ah, not too bad. But definitely in the regime where processing the data takes longer than taking the data. Yes. <laughs> Unless you have some sort of very parallelized uh, machine set up for it. Yeah, we expect to have more than 24 hours just for transferring the three hours of data we acquired last night with Chimera. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you want to volunteer to help me with the data reduction, David, please. <laughs> Just, you know, you have my email, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, yes, okay. right. Yeah. So how big are those images then? The images themselves are not huge, but uh, we are observing with a cadence of five milliseconds. So each data cube uh, is in the order of... Um, 80 mega, um, 800 megabytes, and uh -huh. one data cube every minute, a couple of minutes. Wow, yeah. 
Does this thing pretty brutal. Home, by the way, this object, the one we're going to? Sorry, what, what was your oh, question? It's a, master. it's a master object. Yes. Well, that's interesting because that's been discovered by one of the robotic telescopes at Sutherland. Funnily yeah, enough. it's quite far south, so I assumed it was some southern observatory that must have found it. Yeah, so MASTER is a network of 40 centimeter telescopes, which is um, situated, uh, some of them in Russia, there's one in Argentina, one in South Africa. Those are the only two southern hemisphere ones. Then there's one in, uh, um, uh, one in La Palma as well. And in fact, they're quite, um, they've been quite good at doing follow-up of GRBs with, um, with MASTER. The trouble is that it finds so many of these dwarf novae that, um, it, you know, not all of them can be uh, followed up because um, there's just so many of them. Yes, at this magnitude range, they are definitely the most common transient. Yeah. So I think they said this one was, was 15.8 magnitude. Okay. We get, we get pretty excited when there's a supernova at 15.8 magnitude. It's not rare, but <laughs> it's enough, enough that we get excited about it. Uh, yeah. whereas, so what filter do you want? Uh, well, let's see, what did they report in? Probably an unfiltered is what they reported. So, you know, R is probably the best. Oh, it's okay, good, yeah. okay. Let's do that then. Um, so we don't know, oh, I'm just gonna um, start running it. Uh, without recording the data just to see how bright it is and check its position here. Um. Yeah, so if any of you are, are uh, watching this and also the Slack, if you click on the, the little finder chart link I just posted and bring that up on your screen, you can see if you can match that to what we're about to see with, with the horizontal flip that, uh, of course, we have to uh, factor in. Okay, we're on the field, so I'm just trying to see where it might be. Was there an ATEL alert on this? There was, yes. I might go to that because they have the um, uh, they have the uh, images from the master telescope. Um, do you have it there? Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at I'm looking at it now. And I'm trying to match the field. Is, so is that URL here? with the archive, is that, uh, oh, that was from Thomas. Was that, that's not the object, is it? Um, yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> I think that was it, an earlier. They don't give a field of view on their image, so I'm not, and I'm not sure how what scale to match things up on. Um, I'm just going to look on on the A tail. Which number was it? Um, one second. It was one three nine five four, I think. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah. So it is north up and east to your left, or is there some other orientation? Yeah, north up and east to my 
Well, no, in, in my normal image, it's uh, north up and east to the left, but it's flipped. So it'll be north up, west to the left for you. If you're looking at my webcam image. Yeah, right. 13954, right? The yep. ATEL? Yeah. Oh, I see I'm actually an author on that ATEL. Oh, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm just going to... Yeah, okay. I've got the, why don't I see it? I don't even recognize the field actually. Ah, oh, there we go. That's there. Uh, and there's those two. There's that pair. And it's just below that. Okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. I see it. Okay, well, you, I clearly haven't done this in long enough because I haven't managed to match anything. The scale is very different, of course. So the object is uh, this one. Ah, okay, yes, now I'm starting to see. It's the object right in the middle. Yeah, yeah, so we're only seeing the very center of this, uh, this image here, uh, if you're looking at the ATEL posting. Okay, so I'm going to set up um, what exposure time, do you think? Well, uh, if we're clearly seeing it at this, you know, we few second integrations on the guider, we won't yeah. be much. Uh, should we stick with five seconds then? Um, yeah, that's probably fine. Or do you want to go less? Well, I mean, it's not varying on five second time scales, so just for, to make the data processing a little easier, and to make the images a little prettier, it's probably better to, uh, to yeah. do a little longer. So 2020 or something is probably fine. 20? Yeah, I'd say 20. Or 10? 10, yeah, 10 is also fine. Let's do 10. Okay. You never know, it might show a bit of flickering. Um, okay, I think we're ready to roll. I'm just gonna get a guide star here. And so 10 seconds. Um, repeats. There's a nice guide star.
Seeing's got a lot better. It's down to one arc second now. Yes, well, we're posting, we're pointing closer to straight up than we were, at least when we were doing Centaurus A. Yeah, indeed. Uh, which, you know, always helps in many ways, as you might remember uh, talking to the students here from Robert's lecture. Seeing gets better, the sky gets darker, and there's less obscuration by the atmosphere. Okay, we're ready, we're rolling. So this is the, the images. Every 10 seconds, you'll see them updating. So the, the target's this one in the middle here. So I've set it up to do 200 repeats of 10 seconds, so 2,000 second total observation time. We can carry on longer if you wanted to. So does everyone know what a dwarf nova is? Does anyone know what a dwarf nova is? I have a vague idea what a dwarf nova is. <laughs> so it's another one of these cataclysmic variables with a white dwarf which is accreting from a, uh, a more normal solar type or subsolar star. Um, it's different to the things I was talking about before because the white dwarfs are not strongly magnetic. So the material that's lost through Roche lobe overflow from the companion forms an accretion disk that surrounds the white dwarf. And that's responsible for most of the emission in these systems. As the material spirals down into the gravitational well of the white dwarf, uh, it causes frictional heating of the gas that makes up the accretion disk. So the accretion gets, disk gets hotter and brighter the closer it is to the to the white dwarf and in normal circumstances um, accretion disks uh, are fairly stable if the mass transfer rate from the secondary star to the white dwarf is at a particular um, rate uh, what happens is the the mass transfer um, through the disk um, you know, it, it, um, it's typically in what's called a stable um, hot state where um, the disk doesn't really change very much in its overall brightness, except just due to flickering, which is due to the, the sort of viscous um, interactions that are going on with the plasma that makes up the disk. But in some systems where um, the accretion rate is lower, um, there isn't a stable configuration that the disk can always be in. So what tends to happen is that the mass builds up in the disk um, and it flips between a hot state um, and a cool state. And in so doing, um, you get these um, sort of triggered outbursts as it moves into the hotter state when it becomes a dwarf novae and you get a, a heating wave that propagates through the accretion disk which raises the whole thing up in terms of both its temperature and its viscosity uh, and so it, it's really a consequence of the instability of the disk that causes it to become a dwarf nova. And there are various types of dwarf novae which um, have different properties, somewhat dependent on the orbital periods of the systems. Some, some of the systems have um, accretion disks that are not necessarily circular, that they're, they're more elliptical in shape and they can process. So you get a number of different effects like uh, periodicities that are different to just the orbital period of the system. 
So I don't know very much about this one. It's just been flagged as a potential dwarf novae, but um, without knowing the orbital period, uh, it's a bit hard to classify it, um, as is the case for most of these new transient dwarf nova discoveries. Yeah, so as far as I know, it's brand new and was unknown to the world until yesterday. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I should, have, should read what my co-authors wrote on this. <laughs> Vladimir Lupinov and his group in Moscow. So you might consider getting a few filters here, including perhaps the U-band, since I, I think we'll see this easily in U-band. Yeah, um, that's true, actually. Assuming it's not too dust extinguished. Yeah, so um, what I'll do now is I've done, um, we've done 37 repeats. So we've done about six minutes worth. Um, I'm going to stop it and do as you suggested, Dan, and do some filtered photometry. Okay. And then after that, we'll probably wrap up, uh, since I at least will want to take a bit of a break to get something to eat before I join the next session. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> So does anybody who's still here have any uh, questions or anything they want to ask about? Or anything that's on your mind in general? I had a question um, about the, um, oh, what was it, the last thing we were looking at where you were talking about how it's um, quite highly polarized. Oh yeah. Um, um, I was wondering if the SAO has um, like a polarimetry um, yes. Yeah, that's exactly how we discovered it was polarized. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was through, uh, it was actually discovered to be this very strongly variable two minute period by Tom Marsh, who's a, a collaborator of mine at Warwick University. And um, we were talking about, he was telling me about this amazing object. And I said to him, gee, this is really something there where we should maybe take a look with the polarimeter to see, you know, um, if it's polarized. And uh, that's how it all came about in 2016, I guess. Yeah, it was 2016. I had an observing run with, with what's called HIPPO, which is a, um, uh, a photon counting polarimeter that we have here. It's quite a unique instrument, actually, because it's, it's based on really ancient technology. It's a photomultiplier tube, not a CCD, but it means it's photon counting. So it counts every photon and it has, um, uh, we run it in a one millisecond time resolution mode where every photon comes in, gets time tagged and, um, and we can basically measure uh, both linear and circular polarization with it. And um, that's how we discovered that it was strongly polarized with that uh, hippo instrument. So it was hippo on the SAAO as well, did he say, or is that on a different? Yeah, uh, on the SAO, not on this telescope. This is the one meter telescope that I'm on tonight, but there's a 1.9 meter or 74 inch, they still call it because it was an old imperial unit. Another Grubb Parsons telescope. And um, yeah, it was observed um, with that. Um, okay, I'm going to do some U band now, Dan. Um, I guess I'll give it a bit longer exposure time. Yes. I don't know, maybe a minute. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be good. Maybe what, three repeats? Yep. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. All right, so there we go. We're all set. Start. So 
So the sun has now finally set here for your information. Say that again? The sun has now finally set here for your information. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I should go back and have a look at what the uh, weather's doing. And for anyone who is planning on continuing on for the LT session, you can go to the site that I just posted to see a webcam of the Liverpool telescope, which will be opening pretty soon. Uh, so you can see at that one that the dome is currently closed, but uh, a little bit before sunset, it starts opening up. And then we'll do a calibration sequence, which we'll probably be able to join uh, just as it's getting started. Yeah, it's a beautiful night. Yeah, the seeing, do you see this? Um, I've just shared the weather page again. Yep, we got it. So here's a plot of the seeing. It's down at uh, one, one arc second now. So the other, other things here are, um, this graph is the relative humidity uh, and the red demarcation up here is indicating when it gets a bit um, close to uh, too high humidity to operate, particularly if we get um, condensation, if the um, dew point level gets too, um, too low. I guess if, if there are any other transient objects of interest, like, well, anything really, um, during the rest of the school, even though you're not having any more live sessions like this, um, you can send them to me and I could, um, I could observe something. Because I'm on for, well, I'm on for tonight and tomorrow night, and then my student takes over for the rest of the week till the following week actually till Tuesday next week. Okay, well that's very generous of you. So yeah, so students uh, feel free to continue to post uh, suggestions even after tonight if you have something in the cell that sounds interesting, that's a, that's a transient object. The more interesting, the better. <laughs> so like if there's really is a GRB that goes off, we could, uh, we could try that, but. That's unlikely, I guess. Yeah, the trouble with GRBs is there's, there's, you know, one or two a week, but half of them are behind the galactic plane or in the wrong hemisphere or close oh, to the sun. And so the number that you actually end up being able to observe on a timely basis ends up being more like once a month or less. I know. I mean, we've, I mean, SALT has been operating since 2005. And I think I can count on one hand the number of GRBs we've been able to, to observe. Um, partly because of this problem in, the, in this all sky image. You know, if a GRB went off over here, we'd have to wait for a few hours before it would move into the window of visibility of the telescope, this annulus and GRBs fade incredibly fast. So I don't know, it's sort of like um, a few magnitudes per thousand seconds, isn't it, Dan, that they, um, that they can fade, so. Oh yeah, they, I mean, in the very beginning, yes. So they can disappear to, into obscurity very quickly. So here, here's the U-band image, which is interesting because You'll notice it's much brighter than the. So we're still uh, seeing your uh, your your weather. Oh, no, view sorry, here. sorry. I have to switch yeah. the screen again. There we go. So I don't know if you remember the previous image, but the object was fainter than these two little stars here, 
and here it's really bright. So it's, it's obviously uh, a very uh, ultraviolet object, which makes sense for a, a dwarf nova because of this um, hot disk that, uh, hot state that the disk goes into means that it's a very high temperature and therefore lots of UV photons are emitted as a thermal source. It's, a, it's basically a, a thermal object. Um, okay, I've seen the whole image. Three U bands. So, should we do some G, R, and I now? Uh, yeah, let's at least get G. Okay. Did, did you get R before? Oh, well, we're doing R. Yeah, we were doing R repeats. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I think we only, we only need G. You can maybe get I, but then uh, we'll have to, you know, switch over. It's yeah, really sure. Time. Uh, and we won't need to go as long as a minute either. I think I'll just do 20 seconds. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, there's the um, there's the G band. And then um, finish off with the I then. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, look how much fainter it is in I compared to the other two stars. Oh, what the heck? I, I think we should just finish with the, with the Z. I'll sure, that Z. was very fast, so why not? Yeah.
I uh, just saw Igor's message. <laughs> yeah, your success rate in that department is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Pity about the rest, though. <laughs> that doesn't matter. No. <laughs> I've just been chatting with Jeff actually about his forthcoming DWF run. Yeah, it should be, uh, should be online. So, so looking forward to working with you on that one. Will you have uh, salt for follow-up or uh, yeah. were you thinking of other resources? Oh, salt and uh, in fact, I was talking to him about Meerkat, uh, Meerlicht, I should say, the wide field facility. Um, but also we will be running this telescope and the 1.9 meter telescope during that, uh, that run. So um, there's potential for SALT and three other telescopes to be involved. That's very nice. Do you know about Meerkat itself? Yes. Um, well, I think Jeff has been in contact with Patrick Vogt. Um, I'm not, 100% sure about that, but um, he certainly had uh, Meerkat support last year when he had the DWF run. Um, and I imagine he's asking for it again this time, but I'm not 100% sure actually. Yeah, I'll check directly with him. It would be quite exciting yeah. to have Meerkat again on Sky again, along with the yeah. optical. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, we finished those um, Z frames. There they are. Again, they look quite nice, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, quite well, impressive. This band also often looks good because it's the reddest and has the best seeing. Yeah, but I just used to seeing but, awful fringing. Yeah, there's no I, fringing. So you said there was fringing, but I don't see it, of course. No, I don't see any breath. fringing, which is really puzzling to me. I mean, um, yeah, maybe it's just particularly good conditions tonight and the OH is not so... Prevalent? I don't know. <laughs> I would, that would amaze me if that was possible. <laughs> yeah, well, it would too, but huh. maybe when you come to actually look at process the data, you'll see evidence of fringing. I don't know, but yeah, um, quite possibly. Uh, yeah. Okay, guys. So, should we call it a night then? Uh, yeah. Unless anybody has any like final questions or anything they want to uh, share before we take a little break. I guess there's people across many time zones, am I right? Yes, I think we have someone on every continent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe Australia, uh, where the time zones are just impossible. Uh, yeah, that must be pretty bad there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Um, so unless somebody jumps in in the next 10 or 15 seconds, I guess we'll, we'll call it here. But again, don't go away uh, for long, uh, you know, unless you, you, know, you go to bed, of course, because we'll have another telescope, uh, which operates in a quite different way. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see the contrast uh, coming up and starting in about 10 minutes. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, yeah. So let's thank uh, David for, for showing this and, and generously uh, offering to share uh, his observing session with all of us and take some data for us. Um, I think you said you'll, you're going to make the data available online at the end of the night? Yeah, what I'll do is I'll copy across um, the FITS files. Um, I'll probably put them in a zip file and put them on the cloud, um, on our SAO cloud, and I'll just give you the link to that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, then. Yep. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the session then. But uh, yeah, thanks again, everyone, for joining and, and hope to see you again in uh, about 10 minutes. Bye, everyone. Bye.